you turn with me to the epistle of First John chapter 3? And the projection on your screen is from the New Living Translation. Would you please stand when you have that? If you can stand, if you're able to stand, would you please stand? We're going to use uh, 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 17 as a starting place for the discourse today. But I think it's important that you understand who this writer is. John, the person who wrote the first of three epistles that's found in your New Testament, is also the author of the gospel narrative that bears his name, the gospel according to John. And of course, those of you who are familiar with the scripture, you know that in the gospel according to John, we have what is called the upper room discourse. And in the upper room discourse, John is careful to tell us what Jesus taught his disciples before he was crucified, resurrected, and ascended. And the main lesson that Jesus taught his disciples was that we are to love one another. Amen. Jesus says, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. Amen. And so this John, whose letter we are considering this morning, is also the writer of the book of Revelation. He is the oldest living apostle. At the writing of this, he was an aged man. All of the other 12 had died. He was the last one living. And his theme was how to live together. And so in this epistle, 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, we see these words. We know what real love is, talking to believers, you and I. Because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we all also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. And this is how you do it. If anyone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? This is the word of God. Can you please be seated? This message this morning is really, is really tailored for the members of my church family, my church family, the Union Baptist Church family, specifically for the church at large, generally, and you can, you can eavesdrop if you don't fit into either one of those categories. Uh, but this is what the Lord has laid on, on my heart to say to you this morning with the few minutes that I have. Uh, I said earlier today that this trip to Nigeria for me um, because of what I seen, because of what I touch, because of what I tasted, because of what I heard has been transformative. And I likened it to Malcolm's transformation after being in Detroit and learning Islam under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and then taking a trip to Mecca which every practicing Muslim ought to do, take a trip. He went to Mecca, and the experience that he had in Mecca, what he touched, what he heard, yes. what he saw, right. what he felt, mm -hmm. transformed his what we call hermeneutic. Yes, so when he came back home, his interpretation of Islam and the Quran and the practices of Islam, he saw they were different yeah. Yeah. because of his experience. And I want to suggest to you, submit to you this morning, that because you sent your pastor to Nigeria to see the faces of those who are the recipients of the benefits that we send, and being with them and hearing them has transformed, at least for a season, my interpretation of scripture. way back home on the airplane I had uh, I was 42,000 feet you know I was I was closer to God <laughs> than I've been in a long time uh, but I I contemplated I contemplated my experience and I have to I have to tell you that whenever I thought about what I seen and how I felt it always brought me to tears and I just got over that maybe a day or so ago uh, because
because my, I have a heart filled with compassion for the people of God. Yes. But in looking at their situation, it helped me to understand, and this is what I want to share with you this morning. It helped me to understand better why the Lord Jesus Christ talked and talked so much about money. Yeah, 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 yeah. Jesus talked more about money than he did about heaven and hell, than he did about salvation. He talked more about money than any other topic in the New Testament. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And Jesus launched his ministry as a young man of color, about 30 years old, living in an oppressive community yeah. under Roman domination right. with police brutality yes. against people like him mm -hmm. with a puppet king in place who could care less about the common people. Yes. Yes. And the first time the common people gathered at Jesus' feet was in that scenario that we call the Sermon on the Mount. Yes. At the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talked many things, but the first thing he said was, blessed are the poor in spirit. Yes. Yes. But then he went on to teach some very significant lessons about money. And he was talking to common people just like you and I. Yeah. This is his first message. And he talked about, lay not treasure up in heaven. He said, he's, I'm sorry, he says, lay not treasures up on earth where moth destroys and thieves break in and steal and rust out. He says to these common people, lay up treasures in heaven. Yeah. Amen. Amen. He, said, he said to them, he said, I need you to know something. I know you don't have a lot of resources, but you can't serve God and money. He said, you can't have two masters. You can either serve God or you can serve money, but you can't serve them both. And then he says, don't worry about food. He said, take no thought for tomorrow, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. Because your Heavenly Father already knows yeah. what you need. He said, God knows. He said, God won't let a sparrow fall from the sky without paying attention to it. And if God loves a sparrow like that, then how much more? Will your Heavenly Father provide for your need? And I got some people in here today that have lived long enough and come through enough things in your life that you know that God will provide. Have I got any witnesses in here this morning? You don't have to worry about God will As a matter of fact, at some point along your life journey, living in relationship with God, you stop worrying. Because you discover there ain't no need to worry because God got your back. Jesus talked a lot about money. And then when he left the Mount, then in his ministry, parables and teaching about money, he taught about the parable of the talents that God gave everybody some money. And that money is to be invested. He talked about the shrewd manager about how people in the world manage the resources for the world better than the people of the kingdom manage resources for the kingdom. He talked about the widow's might, how the poorest among people give better than those with resources. He talked about the good Samaritan and how this Samaritan man took his money and helped the person who was in hard time. He talked about the rich young ruler. He talked about the parable of the fish and loaves. He talked about the rich man and Lazarus. He talked about the parable of the sheep and the goat. He talked about the change of Zacchaeus when he was converted. How he went from being greedy and self-centered to being generous. Because you can't meet Jesus in the right way and stay greedy and stingy. And then, in wrapping up, in the Gospel according to Mark chapter 14, it kind of sums up what I want to say today. If you recall, Jesus was at the house of Simon the leper. And at the house of Simon the leper, they had given Jesus a banquet. They wanted Jesus to come. Jesus went to the banquet, and there were all dignitaries there. Simon was there, and his big shot friends were there. 
and there were some big preachers there, <laughs> dignitaries. Mm -hmm. And a woman came in and knelt down. She had a very expensive box of spikenard, which was very valuable. She broke the box of spikenard and poured it on Jesus' feet and on his hair, preparing him for his death. The people of means, the money managers, the people who know best what to do with resources, looked at each other and they were, according to the text, indignant because they thought that this woman with this expensive, not expensive, very expensive box of spikenard could have used it better than pouring it out on Jesus. But Jesus rebuked them and he said, y'all leave her alone because she's done what she can. And then Jesus said this, he said, the poor you will always have with you. And that's the point. The poor you will always have with you. Now I understand that the word poor is relative. Amen. The, the word, there are people with abundance and then there are people with adequate, but there are people with nothing. In this fallen world, there will always be inequities. You can't help it. The poor you will always have with you. There will always be poor people. And the reason I'm emphasizing this is because the people that I visited, that you sent me to visit, are poor. They have nothing. And see, a lot of us, we, we get upset because we don't have money in our pocket. But you got something to eat. You got some clothes to wear. You got shoes. You got a roof over your head. And you walking around with your face hanging down because you don't have any money. You're, and, 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 and you don't want to go to work. You know what, I saw, I saw a lot of poor people, I didn't see anybody lazy. Okay. Amen. But I don't want to go there this morning. But I sure feel like it. I don't, I don't want to go there, but I sure feel like it. I sure feel like it. I sure feel like it. Sure feel like it. Yeah, but you know, I, I don't know what else is happening in this economy, but I do know people are getting jobs. And if you have to work around the clock to get what you need, then that's just what you got to do. How are you going to lay up and watch television eight hours a day when you get off your job for working eight hours and cry about broke? Get up! Go get another job! Because I'm comparing what I saw with what we are. And I want you to know the person in this room right now with the very least, you have more than what the people have that I visit. As a matter of fact, if some of those people have what you have now, Lord have mercy, they would be rich. We saw a number of people, Lord have mercy, blind people, lame people, sick people. Remind me of the pool of Bethesda. People with infirmities. And this is where we went. Now, I can't brush the entire country with this brush, but this is what we saw. This is where we went. Uh, we went to one church, and the widows came to greet us. There were one church, one church, 150 widows. 
young, old, whose husbands had died prematurely or whatever, but they were widows indeed. And they came to the church because it was that day. We've been there on that day. Once a quarter, four times a year, the church, with the help of the Ebenezer Foundation, would give them bags of food. And when that food ran out, y'all, I don't know how those people ate. Wow. Some of our widows here, I understand you have hard times, but some of y'all get social security. Amen. 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 Or you got people around you who will slip you a few hundreds. There's some folk that won't let you be homeless. Amen. 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 Or, or without your medication. Or without food. But these people have nothing. Um, no money, no material possessions. All they rely on is God. Yes. And y'all listen, they, these people were grateful. And their expressions of gratefulness put us to shame. Yes. There ain't no, there's no attitude of I deserve this. And that, that, that doesn't, I didn't see that. That doesn't exist. No, you know, you know, oh Lord have mercy. I, I, I don't want it's, this might let me this might sting a little. But these people were gracious. They were prepared for us wherever we went. They were grateful. They were thank you. They say thank you by bowing down. I had to stop them from bowing down when I said, don't bow down to me. Don't bow. We, I was given, we were given one of the little kids a, a uniform, and they prostrate themselves, y'all. That's how they say thank you. I, I couldn't, I had to get down as low as I could because it didn't come from me. It came through me. And I had to stand up in a meeting and say, you need to understand that this money does not come from me. It comes from the God that you're worshiping. It's just coming through me. Because I have nothing to give. Nothing to give. They were generous, y'all. They gave out of their poverty. So this gives new light to 2 Corinthians. I didn't know what it meant to give out of your poverty. They gave out of, they didn't have anything to give. If they had a sandwich for dinner, I had, we went to a place where they might have a sandwich for dinner. They gave it to us, yes, yes, even yes. though we couldn't eat it. Yes, yes. That's giving out of your poverty. Yes, yes. They blessed God yes, yes. for all that God was doing. They depended totally upon God. Now, so here's, here's where it relates to us. These are children of God. These are God's children. Yes. They have been born again of the Spirit. Yes. And they are in the family of God. Yes. And so this was, these are God's children. So when I thought about that, and I thought about the verse in Malachi, the tithing verse, y'all know which yeah. one I'm talking about? Uh, the tithe, y'all, is God's method of distributing yes. resources. Yes. Yes. See, you, you and I can only do so much, yes. but together we can do a lot. Yes. We can't save all the poor people in Nigeria, and God has not asked us to. He's given us some people. Yes. <laughs> we, we can't save everybody, but we are responsible for these people. The tithe, so let me talk about, let me talk about the tithe. The tithe in our church, I can't speak for everybody's church, but the tithe in our church is God's method of distributing, distributing resources. That's God's method. So in Malachi, when it says, uh, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, y'all know that one? Yeah. And then he's speaking on behalf of God that there may be food in yeah. my house. Y'all yeah. yeah. remember that? That's yeah. in the Bible. You can look at it. Yeah. You can look, it's in there. Yeah. He says, 
bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And prove me now, right? So when he says, food in my house, before I went to Nigeria, I thought he was just talking about Union Baptist Church. I thought he was talking about, y'all bring the tithe so we can meet the needs of this community, so we can do what we do. But God said, no, -uh. my house is wherever my children are. is not relegated, designated to a single location. Wherever my children are, that's my house. So when you bring the tithe that there may be food in his house, he's talking about feeding these people who are his children. Now, 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 I know that doesn't mean much to you. Um, but uh, let me say it like this. Uh, you snooty Christians who know everything, <laughs> who decided wow. that you are not going to give tithe, you know what you're doing? Wow. You are receiving blessings that God can only give you. And in return, you are turning your backside to him. Yeah. Yeah. I need to say that again. That's sobering, isn't it? That stings, doesn't it? You as blessed as you are. And you want to walk around talking about praise God. I'm too blessed to be stressed. Look how God is blessing me. And then when it comes time to give God that which belongs to him, his tithe. God blessed you and promoted you and gave you skills and gifts. And you making money and you living beyond your means. So now you in debt and you still walking around looking down your nose at other people. This is what you're doing when you refuse to give God his tithe. You are turning your backside to God. Now chew on that. So there's a text in the Old Testament. There's a text in the Old Testament. And, and I did it in, in one of my studies with, with Joe Gregory. We were in Oxford somewhere. And, and it, it struck me it, it, that in the temple, in the temple, there, was, there were uh, places where the priests could hide. And they were, they were bringing idols into the temple of God. And the text describes it that when you bow down to your idol, your backside is to God. When you reject, refuse, I'm just not going to do it. And then you come up in here praising God, you ain't really praising God. So look at the text. The text is talking about real Christians. They're talking about people who have been genuinely converted yeah. by the power of the Holy Spirit washed in the blood. And y'all know that there's some people in the church that are not born again or washed with the blood. And there's going to be a time of judgment when you are going to go and stand before Jesus. And you're going to say, Lord, Lord, we cast out demons in your name. Lord, we did miracles in your name. Lord, I served in your name. I was at church every Sunday in your name. And Jesus will say to that individual, depart from me because I don't know you. And you know why he doesn't know you? Because you have never been born into his family. So John is talking to people who have sure enough had a heart transfusion. And this is what he said. We know love. We do. You and I, born again, we know love. Because we know how unloving we are. And how unlovely we are. But we know love. Because Jesus gave his life for us. 
And because he gave his life for us, we ought to lay our lives down for one another. We know love because Jesus laid down his life. So, so um, in, prepare, in making preparation to go to Nigeria, we had to go to our doctor. We had to look at what the uh, Center for Disease Control recommend for inoculations for for trip. And uh, we had to take. We had. I'm still taking anti-malaria pills. We had to do all of that because. In the environment, the conditions of the yeah. environment, yeah. our bodies are not immune to yeah. certain kinds of yeah. germs and all of that stuff. And we could go there and get really, really sick. Yeah. Yeah. So we had to make preparation to go there. So we went there, and Pastor Williams, I had, I took time to press my uh, cargo, uh, cargo khakis. <laughs> no, I had, I had, the, I had the new shoes. Uh, for walking and the, the, the white men, that's all I took, white linen shirts, white linen shirts, roll my sleeves up, put the hand sanitizer in my pocket. And then I went to where the people were. And the conditions made me sick on the stomach. And these conditions, the filth made me sick on the stomach. Yeah. The people, the way they look, I would touch the kids and immediately turn my back and wash my hands with hand sanitizer. Wow. I come from the West, uh -huh. and I come from a certain condition. Yeah. Yeah. So my apartment is clean and swell. My dishes are washed. I have a commode that we keep clean. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. I come from a certain condition. So when I go into those conditions, I'm thinking I'm condescending. I'm going down. But Jesus. Let me let me let me let me write, let me let me let me say it like this. Jesus laid his life down as an expression of love, and that's a fact. Um, but we dare not look at Jesus as simply putting on human flesh yes. and dwelt among yes. us. Yes. He did more than that. Yes. He had to descend. Yes. In other words, the one who was with God yes. and who was God, Hallelujah. who was with God in the Hallelujah. beginning, had unimaginable beauty. Yes. He was perfect in purity. He was perfect in holiness. There is no darkness in him. And his glory outshines the sun. He put on a robe of sinful flesh. I know you know what? Some of y'all are not grown enough to get this. He could not come dressed the way he was. In order to come to us, in order to come down to the mess of sinful humanity. And I know you think you looking pretty good right now. I know you got on your Coco Chanel. And I know you got your underarm deodorant. And you got on your best Sunday garments. And you think that you brush your teeth, your breath is fresh, fresh. And I know you think you look, but you, compared to God, are a mess. You know what? This is why, this is why in the Old Testament, the sacrifice for sins, y'all need to read it. If you never read Leviticus, Numbers, you need to read it. The sacrifice, it had the, the, those animals that were slain. Lord, that was that was grim. That was, that was, I mean, on the inside, you got animal feces, guts, and everything. It had to be taken on the outside of the camp. Can you imagine the flies and the smell and the maggots? Can you imagine how gross and awesome and nasty it was? And you know what it points to? It points to sin. That's what we are. And God, in the person of Jesus Christ, put on the matter of flesh and came among us. Don't you go down your nose at another person. Don't you dare look down your nose at another person. The next person you see in America 
know himself. Yes. Y'all, that's an understatement. Yes. And made himself of no reputation. Yes. And y'all know we big on reputation. Oh, yes. Yes. Let me say this. Let me say this before, and I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. I'm gonna baptize you. <laughs> When I look at our congregation, our people here, some of the, the people with the most meager income, I'll give some of y'all that's walking around with designer purses, driving big cars, and got position and status. And this is what the Lord says to you. Shame on you. Shame on you that God could bless you like that and you let a poor mother out give you. Shame on you. Shame on you. So don't talk about how good God has been because what you've done is stolen his tithe. Turn your back and show him your backside. Not only did Jesus come down in flesh, but he died on the garbage dump. Yes, yes, yes. He was crucified on Golgotha. It was a garbage dump yes. where he laid down his life. Yes. Yes. So this is what the Bible says. The Bible says, we know love. By the way, Jesus gave it. Laid down his life for us. So he said, now you Lay down your life for others. And they're not saying you got to go die for anybody. That's not what he's saying. He's saying lay down your life. So the example I did this morning, yeah. one more time. When we were growing up, when I was growing up with eight, there were eight of us siblings and mom, single parent. And uh, there would be times when we ran out of food. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. Yeah. And even then, I realized I was richer than some of the children that I saw. That's what, so we would, we would, there wouldn't be enough food. And so mom wouldn't eat. She waited till everybody else ate and made sure that the kids were full. And then if there was anything left over, then she would eat. She laid her life down for us. Yes. And that's what the word is saying to you. Yes. That love is expressed by giving what other people need. Yes. And I want to commend wow. you, man. This, this is my last word for real. I want to commend you. This is for real. <laughs> there are a number of you who are faithful in giving. And if, your, if our church is like the average church, it's like 20% of the congregation is funding consistently what 100% of the congregation ought to be doing. Yeah. I want to commend that 20%. I, you, I want to commend you who are tithers. And this is how you tithe. You don't tithe on your net. No, you tithe on your gross. Can I just put it out there? Since I'm telling the truth this morning, you tithe on your gross. You tithe on your gross. I want to commend those of you who are tithers because it is your money, your faithfulness that helps us to feed God's children and to clothe God's children and to educate God's children. The rest of you, I'm praying for you. But I want you to know that God expects his tithe. Yes, look this way, everybody, look this way. Because I want you to know I'm talking to you. Everybody, look this way. I'm talking to you. If there's something coming in, 10% of it belongs to God. Anything that I know you living beyond your means, that's your business. You did that. And if you ever want to get out, let me tell you where to start. Bring the tithe into the storehouse. 
and watch what God does. If I got any kindness here that knows that God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out on you way more than you can. Is there anybody here that knows that God is generous? The more you give, the more he gives to you. Give, and it shall be given to you. Press down, I promise you. Shake it down, I promise. Run it over when people put it to your bosom. But all you need is a bottom in your cup. If you got a bottom in your cup, your cup will overflow. You can't be God-giving. No matter how hard you try. Give God some praise.